What's up guys, Luke here. I'm going to introduce our next guest, Sam Bainham. Sam Bainham is a professional poker player, something that me and Mark, Mark was very interested in, um, learning how this, this this guy makes money, how he makes a living, as well as his journey from being a school teacher briefly um, to traveling the world, becoming a, a poker player. Um, he's also on a bit of a winning streak right now, so it's a great time to have a chat about how he's got there and how he has made a success out of this this different lifestyle. Again, this is something that's going to be a little bit different when it comes to our usual podcast when we're talking about business, when we're talking about sales. I know I really enjoyed sitting down, talking about probability, talking about um, all of the mistakes that me and Mark have made <laughs> when we were gambling um, in different in different games in different areas when we were growing up. Um, so if you're interested in poker playing, if you're interested in building an alternative lifestyle to the nine to five, uh, traveling the world, kind of living on your own terms, I think this is a great podcast for you. And um, we also go into the spirituality side of life as well towards the end and really dig into how Sam keeps balanced uh, when he's going into these big tournaments where the, uh, the stakes are really high. So without further ado, um, I'm going to bring it over to the guys over in the studio. Um, so this is Luke, Mark and Sam Bainham. Welcome to the Shark Pod, the podcast that explores business and lifestyle design in Ireland and beyond. And now, live from Greystone Studios, here are your hosts, Luke Curry and Mark Baker. What is up, Shark Nation? We are, so I don't know if Sam has ever heard that, but uh, we are ready to go here. We are coming from a undisclosed location in South Dublin. Uh, we're on the road, but we're not going to say where. We're going to keep that for uh, a little bit later on. Uh, how are you getting on, Mark? Good, good. We'll keep that until we get permission, maybe. Yeah, Next time. yeah, yeah. I got to work on a few things here, and then I uh, come back. Uh, Luke likes to act first and uh, ask for permission later. Yeah, like my mom yeah. always taught me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're sitting here uh, with Sam. Uh, Sam is a professional poker player, a very interesting guy. Um, so we're really taking a different, uh, a different kind of tact today than we have been doing. We've been doing this kind of every week, Sam. So we're yeah. I listened to a few of the uh, initial podcast that mark sent me and stuff oh, so nice I'm so at least you're one of those five listeners i've yeah. been looking at all the stats <laughs> <laughs> so glad to have one of the avid listeners in here i would say but so we have been really focused on either people in sales people that are start their own business mm-hmm. all that type of stuff um this week we had a photographer so that was kind of the creative side that we were looking into and now we wanted to have a chat with somebody who um is in a uh, kind of alternative Mm-hmm. Uh, business alternative lifestyle almost right because you're uh, it's outside of what the normal uh, nine to five mm-hmm. people um, and it's something that people have always kind of dabbled with I know that I've I've played online uh, with, uh, <laughs> I flirted with uh, yeah. multiple gambling strategies schemes that we were talking about earlier <laughs> yeah, before yeah. all have gone terribly wrong uh, I remember as, <coughs> as they will yeah. 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 I remember I, uh, I was working in an investment bank at the time oh yeah That's and I had gambling. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> wait, wait until you hear this. Um, I actually went to I t- I went for lunch with Mark. This mm-hmm. is years ago, Mark. I don't know if you remember this. It was in KC Peaches. Okay, yeah, in right. Dublin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I I told you that I cracked I cracked the uh, the code for the trading. Okay. Do you remember that it was going to be spread betting. I was going to be. And you send me daily updates and daily updates. This you were betting with fictional money. Yeah. Then we turn it on to real money, and uh, the well, it didn't end well. But uh, <laughs> so I'm out of that game now. So I like to lose money. I don't like to lose money. <laughs> so it's a uh, hurt. But it's just something interesting we can get into maybe Sam as well because yeah, cool. the <clears throat> the mindset or what happens with the mind when money is on the line is so interesting to me. Mm-hmm. When like if you're doing like uh, like spread betting or trading or something with paper money, so you know with demo accounts, <laughs> like you you can act like you're or come off like a genius. The minute you put real money in. The, the the fear the the stress goes through the roof even if it's quite small funds like um, yeah I mean funnily enough the same concept exists within poker you know there's lots of people who can actually uh, dissect poker hands or talk about poker technically very up to date f- you know brilliant minds but when there is the pressure cooker of uh, big money on the line um, sometimes you know. They kind of walk the talk. You know, they, yeah, they quite can't 
they can't really practice what they know because the stakes are as high as they are, you know. So it starts to affect them. So they it affects it affects their performance and it affects their more so their decision making. You know, their de- their decision making is altered by the financial aspect, um, which it shouldn't be. You know, yeah. it, it, should, it should be the same. It should be cold. It should, it and should just be right or wrong. You know, plus ec- plus EV or negative EV kind of decision. Yeah, the money really shouldn't be a factor uh, in it. Interesting. Yeah. So when we so we usually we, we start this in a kind of like a narrative uh, point of view. Um, so you and Mark went back. You played football on the same team back in Selling Noggin, wasn't it? St. Joseph's Boys, yeah. Big yeah. up Selling Noggin, uh, St. <laughs> Joseph Boys. I had to go with the, the Noggin in there last uh, the last day. I've got some feedback. People are not. Uh, Luke's not no longer there. welcome there. Yeah, which is crazy. You know, cause <laughs> <laughs> I grew up there. Um, I remember spending a lot of time on the bench, but uh, yeah. you know, we, were, we were technically yeah. on the same team. Yeah. So how old were you guys then? Would have been 14s, 15s, 16s. Yeah, probably. I think we were on the same team for a couple of years, maybe two or three years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, where are you from, where are you from around? Uh, I'm from Dalkey. Okay, uh, cool. Kind of been around before I got there, but that's where I, my teenage years, I grew up in Dalkey and then obviously Joe's, uh, Coolidge GAA, all that kind of sporting stuff. You, you went know. to Clonkeen as well, didn't you? No, I went no. to Glassdool actually. No, uh, now closed, unfortunately. At the presentation? The Prez, yeah. yeah. So I uh, was... It wasn't much of a sports school at all, but played a little bit of rugby there and, uh, you know, got hammered by all the good teams. So <laughs> yeah. soccer and GAA were, were kind of my sports. And that's where I met Mark. Yeah. Cool. Um, and when you were back in, I remember, so I, I'm not sure what the, the timeline would be on this, but do you remember, does everyone remember when there was like the, the poker, oh, Texas Hold'em craze? The boom. The, almost like a boom where we were all like two or three nights in a week, we were going over to each other's houses, yeah. you yeah. know, uh, drinking bags of cans and... <laughs> Playing, playing low stakes uh, poker yeah. uh, in the Conor Vesey's house or whatever. Um, do you, was that something that you got kind of swept up in, and then it never went away, or uh, what's the? I was aware of it, but I didn't. I didn't. Re- it didn't really get me uh, until a, a, a later, a later stage. But yeah, there was kind of the funny name, the guy, the, the money maker boom, a guy who uh, won a very small tournament to get into a big tournament, whose name was Chris Moneymaker. Uh, Great name for a poker. Incredible name, yeah. <laughs> and he won the World Series of Poker, which is basically, you know, you've completed the game of poker. Okay, uh, so that's the big one. Is yeah, there one the, big that's one? A, that's a 10K buy-in uh, in the summer every year in Vegas, which is the World Series of Poker. It's it's basically, that's it. That's the that's the pinnacle of any poker player's career. Okay. If they can win that tournament. They're set uh, for life then, is that well, enough? Well, I mean, they're going to win mul- multiple millions if they come first in that tournament. Uh, so this Chris like Moneymaker that. guy played a, a small, what's called a satellite which is a small tournament to get in to a bigger tournament to get in to the World Series of Poker. So he managed to parlay his $25, which he had on a computer online, into a 10K entry to the World Series. And then, against all the odds, against all the professionals, managed to win the World Series for, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but multiple millions. It's crazy. Um, and after that, TV got kind of uh, interested, obviously. Rags to riches always sells well. 100%. And there was a huge poker boom. And that's when we all ended up in our friends' kitchens. Yeah. <laughs> playing, <laughs> yeah. having cans, exactly. falling out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Winning 40 quid every now and again. And, and that was it, yeah. Absolutely. So did you, when you were in, so we went to Presbury after that? Where to Pres Glass Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah, Pres Glass yeah. sorry. Where did you, uh, what did you do after that? Uh, I kind of followed the normal path. I went to UCD um, and studied... Uh, arts, uh, English and French somehow. Hate okay. French. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. You know, as I, you do, I, I, like, I have yeah. a history in Greek and Roman. Yeah. 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 I think we were in you were the, together <laughs> You were well. the year ahead of me. Yeah, yeah. you were in yeah. uh, Connor Keogh's year. Connor Keogh, yeah. 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 Um, and then, um, then I kind of found poker and I realized I could make a little bit of money uh, from it. Like in college you were... Uh, kind of yeah, a lot of spare time it, those 12 hour uh, yeah, weeks. Yeah, <laughs> college, to- college I remember I never had a girlfriend in college whatsoever. I discovered poker in UCD and it took up the vast majority of my time, you know. Okay, so that's when they got kind of... Yeah, but I hadn't honed the skills of actually been able to make a living from the game. I, you know, I knew that there was maybe a little bit of money in this game, but yeah. I was still terrible at all the soft skills of, of the game. But, okay. I, I, you know, it did... Uh, university is when I kind of really got involved in poker. And do you play again... When you're in university and you're playing, are you playing against like other students are you kind of moonlighting going to no, the, no, the, the clubs at night or what's no, that no it's like um 
poker sock was was the kind of gateway to to poker and then there was uh the fitzwilliam the now unfortunately yeah. closed fitzwilliam is casino. that closed yeah it closed uh, a couple of months ago unfortunately really? yeah. that was kind of one of my favorite ones around it was like yeah closed overnight <coughs> one one day it was there and then somebody the next came day in and rents the place did they did they uh, win big I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not sure exactly <laughs> yeah. what happened but yeah it, wow. it honestly was there on Tuesday and then it was gone on a Wednesday. Um, and what was cited was some change in the, you know, there's a really grey area when it comes to casinos in Ireland. They're, okay. they're normally labelled kind of like gentlemen's clubs or this kind of weird stuff. Is that why you always have to like sign up when you yeah, go in and they give you a card or something? you got to sign up and they have your details and, well, I mean, that's probably anti-money laundering stuff and all that kind of okay, thing. Okay, yeah. But uh, there's definitely a grey area about... Even poker within uh, Ireland, you know, and if you go to a place like Northern Ireland, it, it's actually, it's not allowed. It's, it's, it's illegal, really? essentially, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't think, because they, I thought the UK guy's like a, like a flutter. Yeah. It seems to Yeah, well, I mean, England, there's numerous poker rooms and casinos and everything, but within Ireland, it's a bit, bit of a grey area, I would say. Okay, yeah. cool. So you're in, uh, you're in UCD, you're in the Poker Society, yeah. um, you're, Kind of maybe doing some online stuff as well. Is that where? You're yeah, that that was when uh, online kind of um, yeah people stumbled upon online, but it was very very small stuff. You know, you'd be playing like little five euro tournament and yeah. kind of lear- you know learning how to play the game. Um, yeah. So and the so this is something that I was wondering about the online, like how uh, sometimes I, I played the online stuff as well, yeah. and not successfully, Mark. Let me tell you as well, um, <laughs> but. Uh, Sometimes you are in the position where you're like, okay, this is a good bet or, you know, the probability is in, in my favor, et cetera. Yeah. And then something happens and then immediately your your mind goes to, this is fixed. <laughs> Do, you know I mean? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How, it's, are they, is there regulation on the online stuff? Should people be careful? I don't know. People should always <laughs> be careful when it comes to anything to do with money or gambling because invariably people are going to try and, uh, you know, cheat essentially. Yeah. Uh, and I would even extend that to the sites that, uh, you know, that that host um, the poker clients and everything else. Yeah. But I mean, I would imagine it's very, very regulated that, that you know, there, there's a couple of really big sites that y- you're definitely not going to be manipulated by the site. It isn't fixed. You know, there's okay. a random number okay. generator that decides what happens. Sometimes it can be easy to be like, oh, my God, this is rigged. Yeah. It's not rigged. But other things could certainly happen. You could be you could be targeted or cheated by a group of players who are playing in collusion together that yeah. that categorically does happen yeah uh, but the sites do have kind of security measures to to try and ensure that it doesn't happen okay um yeah it's that, interesting as well because like the i'm not going to say recently but at some stage in the past i yeah. signed up for uh, like when it was in canada um, there's a lot of Chinese people in Canada. I know, like Baccarat's very, impo- very, uh, <laughs> yeah. very um, popular. Yeah. Uh, with, with with I was going to say that that group of people. Let's say in Chi- or in Vancouver, it's there's a huge Chinese uh, community there. Yeah. Um. So in the casinos, they've got really like kind of big casinos, kind of almost a little Vegasy feel to them. Absolutely. Um. Yeah. And you go in, you play Baccarat, loved it there yeah. because it's you win and you lose quite often. Yeah. But. <laughs> At least you win sometimes. Do you know So you get little, a little uh, kind of dopamine hits. Little, little dopamine hits there. Yeah. And then, so when I came back to Ireland, I said, you know, I'll play a little bit of that or something. So I signed up for a, a website where you can watch it live. All right. Do you know what I mean? So it's like a camera on uh, the dealer, and she's dealing. At the, I guess in you have to call it a punko banco. Is that the? A punto blanco. Yeah. yeah. That, that is a. I mean, the Chinese community is very active within. Uh, gambling in Dublin and extending on to Ireland and they uh, predominantly play Punto Blanco yeah, yeah. because it's a really fast game and it's you win or you lose you know it's yeah. like there's two kind of uh, <laughs> there's no real grey area in the middle you know and it's a very simple game and very fast game where yeah. you either win a lot of money or you it can uh, be very exciting Mark <laughs> okay, I've never even heard so I don't think. the when I was doing this and I I, I was kind of Obviously, you're saying that, that it's not a big deal with the uh, the random generators and all that stuff, stuff with the big uh, poker or, or the big kind of sites. Yeah. But like, I like to the idea of kind of seeing it in live time. So, you know, and there's lots of different people playing. So it's kind of like, a, where would the angle be if they did want to yeah. do you over? Like? Yeah. Um, but then Banco came out like 12 times. Like 12 well, times. I'm yeah. like, that's in the trillions of, uh, well, you know. Yeah, but <laughs> the important thing to remember there is that each time 
is an individual event so it, it's, it's there's no memory it's not like there's any it's like roulette like you know it can conceivably be 600 blacks in a row that is within the realms of mathematical possibilities it would be more <laughs> strange if that never happened uh i mean within a, a big enough extension of time mm. and maths yeah it probably mm. would you know this is so interesting saying that if i was in a casino and it was 600 blacks in a row after around 100 blacks i would be of the mindset that i would start betting on black because to me, it seems more likely that the wheel is skewed in favor of black. Yeah. But even that would be a terrible mindset to have. You know, you shouldn't be near the wheel in the first place because yeah. it's just no matter what bet you make, it's going to be <laughs> yeah. a negative expectation bet. Yeah. So you want to be making positive expectations bets. Yeah. You know, yeah. if there wasn't a green on the roulette wheel, the yeah. game would be entirely neutral. You know, so that little green number, the zero makes Tilts every to them. makes every single bet negative expectation. Okay. So if you go into a casino and you win ten thousand euro in a night playing roulette. Yeah. It's pure to, to my mind you've still lost because you are making bets that are going to over a lifetime yield negative expectation. Okay. You know, so and that that would extend to uh poker, it would expand extend to um sports betting or anything to do you know, yeah. actually trading or anything like that it's all it's all it's all the same thing basically you know <laughs> it's so interesting because the monkey mind we can't like you're saying it's all it's all coming out black let's go black <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what yeah, i mean yeah. like yeah. I, I i've like literally been in the front of the bank that day so you know, i actually built it up <laughs> like I had the first i was in i was in actually i don't know what katie was doing my wife and her friends were doing something i think it was actually it was during the build up to my wedding, so there was a lot going on in the house, and I was just sitting in the bedroom. Yeah, make some extra money. <laughs> yeah, I needed some cash. Yeah, yeah, and after this, uh, yeah. <laughs> imagine putting yourself in hot water. Yeah, <laughs> looking at the wedding fund. Yeah, yeah, looking at the wedding fund, just going down and down. And down. So I was uh, like, so I started playing that, and I was up uh, quite a lot for the day. And the next day, I'm like, oh, I've got this. I've mm. got this down. Like, I've got a bit of a strategy here. You know, I'll do it like this and stuff. Anyway, yeah. so then it was all gone then, and then, uh, but I was only I started off like. 20 quid or something yeah. but the it wasn't big stakes or anything but I, it was so interesting to see my reaction to losing compared to winning yeah it felt way worse to lose of course then it felt good to win mm. and I wonder yeah. is everybody like that what do you think uh, well there's certainly um, a thing within poker of you remember the, the bad beats where you get unlucky more so yeah. than you remember the times you got lucky. You know, your brain seems to reset the times that you got lucky as, oh, I, I played great that day, you know. Yeah, I was really in the zone. Fire. <laughs> Whereas the reality is you might have got lucky in concurrent hands where you were supposed to get knocked out, you didn't. And then maybe a day down the line, you do get knocked out where you're supposed to win the hand. You know, the odds are in your favor, you're four to one favorite, whatever it is. But that's the hand that you remember. You don't remember the three hands where you got lucky to stay in it. Uh, you know, that's probably another thing that extends into life. Like it's not, it's not just within poker or anything. You know, that's the way our minds are just set up to. It's a. It, yeah, I find this the most interesting thing about gambling and about like human behavior. I'm reading a book right now called um, uh, "Fooled by Randomness." Oh yeah, I read yeah. it actually. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. could have been written about me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean, like all the little yeah, yeah. poor examples of decision making is like <laughs> that's me. You know, in a nutshell, what what is the book? So, I haven't read it. That, I can't. Who who wrote it? I can't. Uh, Talib, yeah. uh, Nassim Talib. Yeah, yeah, I, d I did read it actually, and it's it's a great book. And we are, you know, we we sometimes equate success with, you know, performance, or you know, you could conceivably, certainly within poker, perform quite badly, and still over a short sample achieve success. Yeah. Because what the not, I don't want to say the layperson, but what the general population who aren't poker players would say, what you guys would call luck we would have a word for variance which is just a kind of the maths of up and down yeah and eventually that's going to be in a straight line you know if yeah. the maths is enough to to allow it to become a straight line yeah you it's know? one of the things that's that is interesting as well when it comes to um like in investment banking as well yeah it really does matter which which lens you look at from a, a time period <laughs> so mm -hmm. when do you say that you're up is it after a month? Is it after a quarter? Is it after a year? Or are you, unless you lock in your paper gains, yeah, it's never a win. <laughs> but people let that go. I made twelve percent last year, mm. but they didn't actually lock it in. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. last week, the stock market goes down twelve percent. That's a year of gains gone. Yeah, yeah. But 
when does it start when, when does it begin exactly yeah. when are you you know so i wonder so i guess playing poker is kind of like that as well do you kind of track your performance over a long time or are you yeah but i mean you know there, there's kind of two strands of poker there's the online poker where you can now play thousands and thousands and thousands upon hands within a very short period of time uh, but if you're a live poker player that means you know you bricks and mortar casino uh, by definition, there's only 360 whatever days in the year. Yeah. You can only play maybe 20 or 25 hands an hour due to, you know, you have a dealer there tossing out the cards. People take a while to make a decision. So, you know, there actually isn't... Um, you could conceivably be lucky or unlucky for a, for a huge period of maybe two years where it wouldn't be unusual. It would be totally... You know that would be within the realms of of uh, mathematical swings, you know. But obviously, yeah. if you're losing for two years, you're going to be like, okay, you know, yeah, this isn't for me or whatever. Yeah. Whereas you could actually be a winning player, and have just got really, uh, you know, unlucky. You're yeah. yeah. Again, yeah. lucky in quotation marks because it kind of it wouldn't be exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah. That were you know. It's such. A, it's mad. Like yeah. the the. Like you're saying, it's for two years. So this is part of the book as well. Is about when you look at the, sur the survivorship bias of all of the people who, the, like, it's probably like a a net of like a hundred uh, successful quote unquote uh, people in the zeitgeist that we keep we keep on using as examples. Mm -hmm. uh, where in the book they talk about, you know, okay. Steve Jobs comes up a lot on this podcast, kind of in a negative way, I don't know why, <laughs> like just because he's always popping up, or uh, Bill Gates, whatever. Um, but they, if you look back into their, so they, they're hardworking, they're, they've got a good idea, they've yeah. got all this type of stuff. Uh, there's, but there's thousands of people who are, are as hardworking, have great ideas, and for whatever reason, yeah. they didn't meet that person in college who could put them in touch with somebody for funding or whatever. Yeah. And then, the other guy's writing a book when he's 60 about principles. Mm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's very, it, it's, it's hard to know wh where, what the, like the outcome. But there surely is a correlation between putting yourself out there, working hard or meeting more people. Surely you can make the odds in your favor. Absolutely, yeah. The way I was, because I, it did not, I don't know, if, uh, Sam, what you thought, but the book is a little bit, kind of a bummer. Like I it's kind of want to read that <laughs> yeah, book. I, don't know, you I just, like that kind of blind. Yeah. <laughs> but the way I think about it is like, you know, the hard work or the, uh, or the amount of tournaments that you do or something. It's almost like you're getting an extra lottery ball in the, yeah, in the thing. So yeah, I would look at it as, I mean, you have to create the conditions to allow yourself to be on the right side of good fortune. You know, like if you're preparing in, in a bad way or, um, if your mindset isn't in a place that's going to allow you to win all the fortune and all the good luck in the world isn't going to be enough, uh, to propel you towards <laughs> that, you know? Okay. So, well, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, some of those guys probably had better ideas than Bill Gates and everyone else. And, yeah. you know, they maybe tried two or three times and then they gave up and their life went a different way. You know, it's, it's to keep on trying. Keep, keep on trying until <laughs> that luck turns around, Mark. <laughs> to, to go back to the, the timeline here, you're in college. Yep. When does it start to get serious with, with poker? Did you, did you have a part-time job? Did you get a full-time job? Uh, I didn't within, uh, I think, I think I had a little job in a, in a bar or something. Uh, I remember I, I used to work in Finnegan's Dockey and, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Bono would occasionally come in and good tipper, give you a couple of euro. Which Shout out Bono. Great. Yeah. Great good things about Shout Bono on this Bono podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, listen, no, he was really nice. Welcome anyway. anytime on the Shark Pod. That's <laughs> great to hear. Anniversary of Pop, the album Pop today, actually. Anyway, nice. go on. Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Great album. Um, but yeah, then it kind of went from, uh, after university, I, I kind of figured, okay, might be possible to make a career out of this. Um, I did it for a few years. I traveled. I, I met a girl, obviously, and uh, ended up going to, to Berlin, where I found a really nice little game that I could just win in consistently. I didn't have to win much. I had to win two or 300 quid a week nice. just to kind of, you know, Berlin was kind of hipster central, so you didn't need that much money, and it was yeah. fine. Right. Everything was great. Uh, Were you, did you have an aversion to, to a, a normal job? Did you not want to do that? I didn't have a, a, an aversion per se, but I just hadn't really figured out what I was going to do. I'd messed around with uh, teaching English as a foreign language, uh, which I enjoyed, but didn't pay particularly well, and you kind of burn out in it quite quick. You know, it's not a job that you can do for a particularly long 
uh, period of time, in my opinion, that you know that yeah. extends to teaching in general. I would say. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I did take the steps then to have a qualification. I, I went to study um, in Maynooth to become uh, a secondary school teacher because uh, my partner at the time got pregnant and I felt, OK, maybe poker is a little bit too volatile to rely on to, to support the lifestyle or the security that I wanted for my for my family. Um, so but but even within all that, even within Maynooth, poker was always kind of in 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 the shadows uh shadows is the wrong word <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to take it out like, of the shadows here so yeah like. no it's that's the wrong word but you know i always realized there was the capacity there that uh you know i could make money playing playing poker definitely yeah okay um and then so did you ever become a teacher yeah i did i, I taught for one year in a a, a, a wonderful school called uh art school reach on griffith avenue they're Great, uh, yeah. Well, it, it's actually not they they uh, they're not a Gaelic school, but they they're big into hurling and football. So okay, I so loved that. I was able to do oh, all great. the coaching, and uh, I actually loved it. I really really enjoyed teaching. Um, but I, I found um, it was at the time when the the young teachers and the old teachers were kind of young teachers were a little bit sold out by the by the old teachers I'm to yeah. an extent. Yeah. Um, and my I, I my wife got one difficult. year one year. Mm. Uh, she, she, I think she signed a contract in August, and things changed by the end of her yeah, first that year. Was really, that was yeah. kind of the done thing at the time. They would yeah. get young teachers in, enthusiastic, trying to make their mark, and they yeah. would be basically uh, teaching in a school for a year. And quite a lot of the time, they weren't kept on for the second year, and then a fresh batch of new, hungry young teachers yeah. come in, which is great for the school. I mean, you can definitely there's probably pros and pros and cons to that, but. Um, yeah, I, I just felt that teaching wasn't long term uh, something that uh, was a career that I wanted to be in. I, you know, I feel that it's very difficult to go in and teach the same thing. Um, I, and I don't necessarily think you should want to do that. I don't think you should want to teach the same thing for 10 or 15 years because, uh, you know, yeah, you want you want to develop and change as a person mm. and, you know, grow as a person. I'm not saying you can't do all that within teaching, yeah, but it just but personally it wasn't. You can't just start teaching another, another subject. No, so really. no. Like try my hand at uh, metalwork. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the other problem was I was I was teaching French, which I could barely speak. <laughs> okay, so, okay, okay. You know, uh, eventually. <laughs> Maybe there was a, another. another. And thing. then eventually the kids figured out that I had a, a background in poker because there would obviously be stuff online and everything else. And uh, that kind of, I don't know, I found it. The, uh, I, I had a great relationship with the students, but by the end, I kind of felt like that teacher that, you know, you're kind of mates with the teacher as yeah. opposed to them actually kind of, you know. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. Behaving in class, essentially, oh, you know. When you were in school, what were your kind of strongest subjects? Was maths? No, not at all, actually. I'd know, funnily enough, I now read magazines about maths, but when I was in school, I hated, you know, honours maths in yeah. secondary school is hard you know uh, yeah. i did grinds in honors maths i scraped through it yeah. i dreaded the exams i i thought oh my god i'm never going to use this nonsense it's such a waste <laughs> of time yeah i liked english i didn't i didn't like maths at all you know and now now i'm kind of like a maths nerd so I you, like. you found maths through poker exactly uh, the reverse you know probably the way it's supposed to be you know when i found something that i love doing I then needed the maths. Not that the maths, is, n not that the maths of poker are rocket science. Yeah. Although the way the way the game is going now, to the point of it being solved, the maths now are quite complex. Or certainly, you can mess around with complex maths and everything else. But, so uh, to teach kids maths, put some money on the line. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you see, they <laughs> need some cards, Mark. Get for the for the girls. <laughs> they definitely respond to that, you know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess or make a game out of it, or whatever, you know. That's making a game out of it, yeah. as opposed to maybe bringing the gambling element into <laughs> to children. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the way yeah. to go. I think that's yeah. avoided. Be an easy mark as well. I think that <laughs> yeah. probably you know you could beat them very quite easily. Um, so you're so after you're, you decided maybe it's not for you the the teaching, uh, you say au revoir. To uh, yeah, to being whatever a teacher. that means. <laughs> I, I say that shit. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, so, what's the what's that decision like? The day after, you're like, okay, I need to get into some tournaments. Do you have stuff lined up, or are you kind of? Well, it, it wasn't really a kind of decision. Again, like in a, a lot of this, you kind of just I kind of just fell into it, you know. Uh, and I would stress that poker has been taken with varying degrees of professionalism. It's only in the last probably three or four years that I have, I would say that it has become my craft and my and my you know my proper, um, you know, grown up profession. I used to drift in and out of it. I would play, I would make a little bit of money and then I, I kind of wouldn't need to, to play for a while. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. keep, 
I wouldn't keep abreast of the trends because poker changes on a daily basis. It's an amazing game. It's continually evolving uh, as we become more sophisticated with um, technology and and stuff that we can we can plug in numbers to a computer that's going to tell us the exact right thing to do. You know, um, so yeah, uh, kind of after after I left teaching, uh, I started taking it more seriously. Okay, but, but not to the extent of the last three last or four years. Three you know, years. I would still travel a lot. I would, you know, go interrailing for three months. So I went to Thailand for a couple of years. You know, twelve months. You know, this, really, this traveling from Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, all that kind of stuff. Just life on the road. It was appealing to you. Yeah, it was a little bit. Just my friends were doing it. We all traveled around, and yeah. poker at that stage, even then, offered me the means that I could rustle up a couple of thousand to go traveling. Yeah. Uh, While where, you were traveling, I, could could you still earn money? I did. Yeah. I Internet actually, cafes. I actually did. I remember I was running out of money in uh, in uh, where was it? Some awful place. Oh, Perth. Yeah, which I hated. <laughs> I was, <laughs> Hell on earth! There's, there's a big hole. Uh, there's a big hole. Big words. The, there's a big hole. This is a very strong head. opinion about yeah, birth. Yeah, you, can fact, <laughs> you can edit this part out. But I, I did not like birth, but I was in some awful <laughs> casino in Perth, and I was down to my last, like, you know, four hundred bucks for my my traveling fund. And I remember I got in a, a game which I shouldn't have been doing because you should never be, you should never be. Uh, playing poker because it is a form of gambling with uh, money that you can't afford to lose and I certainly couldn't afford to lose this but sometimes weird stuff happens and I couldn't lose in the game and I won a couple of thousand okay. and then the, the the journey then extended on where where I was planning to go home I then went over to uh, Auckland I think wow and uh, continued on the, the traveling was, yeah. was that game really exciting it was it was it yeah, or was stre- like really stressed out about it, it, it was, or? but you kind of you know it's funny when you're in a game sometimes it's looking back on it that you're like, God, that should have been stressful. But when you do, you get it, into a flow state when you're playing poker. You definitely do, mm-hmm. yeah. Especially now, now that I kind of know what I'm doing, you definitely kind of enter into this almost Zen state uh, where you're kind of almost intravenously kind of tuned into the flow of the game of people's kind of moods, shifts, and energies. Is this guy, you know, pissed off about something at home? You know. If he loses a hand, can he not deal with losing a hand? And then his whole demeanor and energy changes. It's it's really weird, and you mm. can you can lo- you know your time, space, all, all that disappears. I mean, you're you're playing for twelve hours at a time, mm. you know. So you're yeah. you're really it, by the end. I mean, uh, if if I'm playing like a three or four day tournament, you know, the day after the tournament, if it goes the full three or four days, I, I'm in bed. You know, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm really? kind of shaky. I'm drained. I'm like. There's a big contrast now between these types of uh, these types of games you're getting in where things are serious, and then like some of the gambling that I've done, maybe with uh, Donald Burns in Vegas at like a craps table, oh, yeah. and where just go, you know, well, craps, craps, <laughs> is the, craps is the, the the crack cocaine of gambling. It's so good, like, <laughs> it's and every, everyone is cheering you on. Yeah. You don't know I these people. I was too afraid. I went to Vegas, and I was too afraid to get up and do it. We oh, did, I, I just didn't know what I was unless if you go to Vegas sometimes you don't know what beauty of craps is you don't need to know what you're doing you just not really just roll the dice, dice and that's then, it. Just, that's then it. there's a guy with a crook sometimes he yeah, takes the money from you the table. I don't know how much money to put on there's different levels to different tables yeah I'm just everyone's there the good, good thing about craps everyone's just having a good time as well I well like. they are until it starts a few sevens start yeah and then the, out the, dice the guy comes out with a crook and just kind of drags the money away yeah. and you're like what's <laughs> going on I got a seven what's going on and then the I thought new, seven was good the new person who joined the table is given like an accusing glance by the old embittered gamblers who like think that he's bad luck or something yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah craps yeah. is kind of ecosystem in itself you know the same way poker is really? weird stuff happens like, there, yeah. Yeah. For, for venues and, and uh, like I would say Las Vegas is is the mecca, you know. It, Las Vegas is, yeah. What's obviously. your opinion? Where's the best place to uh, for a professional to play? Well, you know? I mean, it depends on how far afield you're willing to travel. You know, there are good games that, you know, I have, um, uh, I know of some poker I- Irish poker players who are invited to go uh, play underground games in Iran. You know, so wow. the games are brilliant. But that does you, sound brilliant. I don't know why. <laughs> you have to factor in the fact that uh, it's a place where gambling is entirely uh, illegal and that if a Westerner was caught playing poker, there would okay. be dire consequences. So it's How kind much of, money could you earn there? It's though? kind of a risk-reward. Well, they were playing good games. like They were playing big games. They weren't playing their own money. They were backed, which is a common thing yeah. in poker. Like So basically... Some, okay, someone some, like an investor. 
essentially a guy will figure out that okay this is a really weak game um i can only play one i can only i'm only one person so you yeah. know i can only play so much so he may bring in people he deems competent enough to beat the game and honest enough that they're not going to rob him too much i think you know with see there's two kind of different types of poker there's cash game poker which you just buy in for money and then you can leave at any time well, and then there's the tournament Vegas poker one. you know tournament poker you're locked in you buy in for a thousand euro and it's a tournament like a, the world winner poker. takes all kind of well it wouldn't be winner take all but, but top 15 percent of the field are going to get all the money 85 yeah. percent of the field are going to get knocked out okay cash game you can sit down for 20 minutes treble your money and leave now you wouldn't be well received by the rest of the players at the table it would be uh kind of etiquette uh, you know there's in terms of etiquette it'd be very poor etiquette but so there's etiquette in the poker game oh, as well oh, yeah, yeah, is it yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah yeah that okay. would be a big faux pas that you know you sit down double your money and immediately leave like I th- would you be getting them running i you wouldn't i was going to, to say mark, welcome you, back you're, mark, you're, that you're, is a mark baker move i can <laughs> see that right i wins one big hand all right, all right guys i'll see you, I'll see you yeah. later like why would i gamble this like, it would <laughs> certainly be frowned upon to leave. <clears throat> now there would be a little bit of uh, grace extended to you if you're like of clearly a newbie to poker like they're okay, like okay yeah. give the dude a, you, you just got lucky he so got lucky he doesn't really know what's going on like, yeah enough. Yeah, and as well, th- it's good when people win the first few times they play because, you know, the ecosystem gets bigger. Exactly, Exa- yeah. exactly yeah. that. Yeah, people come back. Yeah. So when you're at what stage? So just from an etiquette point of view, mm. when Mark's clearing these guys out t- tonight uh, over over in the casino, hitting and running is what that's called. Like okay, run. how long do you have to stay until the op- opponents are I mean, have had enough? To be honest, you can even stay there and throw your hand away for twenty minutes, but just don't leave immediately afterwards. You okay. Know? put on a show like sit there pretend you're still in the game yeah. where mentally you're at home you know yeah and how much does uh, theatrics come into it and, and and that kind of thing uh in in terms of people yeah. kind of pretending they have weak hands when they've yeah. good hands or yeah. this kind of business uh well within i mean within um top professionals or not even top professionals but professionals kind of full stop there's varying degrees of good within professional poker players like anything else but i mean the elite poker players will be utterly stoic at the table you know to the point of they'll be wearing like uh what are these called v-necks or whatever polar necks well, polar necks yeah Luke's a fan of them, yeah. yeah not v-necks that's the opposite <laughs> what i'm yeah, trying to that's say what i'm a fan of them yeah but yeah th- uh, yeah good call i would say yeah <laughs> not m- not many people look good in the uh in the ones that cover your neck but a lot of the poker players will wear scarves like the elite poker players who are yeah. playing like the super big buy-in events why so you can't see uh, pulse because oh. pulse rate sometimes gives away, you know, yeah. wh- which yeah. you wouldn't imagine that you can see, but yeah. you actually can. It's really weird at a tournament at the weekend. Uh, I was involved in a hand where if I had been more alert and less fatigued, I would have noticed uh, a guy uh, had a, a very visible physical tell when he had the best possible hand. And it was to do with his Adam's apple. It would move up and down really, really fast. What? When well. he had the best possible hand. This when he didn't have the best possible hand, it wouldn't happen. This know? is like Casino Royale in real life. like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is elements, like physical uh, tells are important, but they're overdone by kind of, you know, James Bond and the lads. Yeah. Like, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There needs to be a, techn- a technical fundamental base to your play. It's not just like you look into this guy's eyes and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you wear sunglasses? Do people wear sunglasses yeah, and you visors? Can, yeah, and I mean, that. again, that looks really ridiculous if you're playing like kind <laughs> of a, a kind of, you know, 50 euro tournament. <laughs> and you're, you're in so the put ba- those sunglasses away then. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, Mark over there in a balaclava, I can't see anything yeah. with facial expressions. <laughs> yeah. People uh, do do it though, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it obviously looks, but you see weird stuff that looks ridiculous like in small, and I mean, I would consider even the games that I play in are kind of like, I mean, they're rinky dink in comparison to like, you know, there, there's a professional, there's the premiership of football as well, where there's people playing for like a, a tournament buy-in might be a hundred thousand dollars, you know, God. so oh. that's like the premiership. And then you've yeah. got like division one, you've got Irish league, you've got, okay. like, you know, senior over 35s, football. you, you know, you've yeah. got the whole food chain there, you know? And how how often would you be doing t- tournaments? Is it mostly cash or tournaments that you're doing? Uh, I I think you have to be competent in both actually because um, there's not always good tournaments to play. Uh, okay. Sometimes there's not always good cash games to play. Uh, so you need to be able to, which a lot of people can't do actually, but you need to be able to play both cash games and tournaments. 
and they're totally different disciplines, you know? Okay. A player who's very good at tournaments may not be able to handle the kind of emotional swings of a cash game, you know? Interesting. Yeah, true. Uh, also, you're going to be playing with uh, a lot more big blinds, which makes the game a lot more complicated in cash game. So in a cash game, let's say the the blind is, the small blind is one and the big blind is two. To, to the layman, what's, what does that mean? Well, th those are obligatory bets to basically okay. keep, the bet, uh, to keep the game moving. So a guy who wants to play only the best hand is going to have to pay for the privilege of being at the table. Okay. So it's kind of obligatory bets that rotate around mm. the table. In tournaments, the blinds go up, so they increase every hour to put pressure on guys who don't really want to play that many hands. But in cash games, they, they stay the same, you know? Yeah. So uh, in cash games, you're playing with a lot more big blinds, you know? So it makes the game way more complicated. Okay. okay. Mathematically, if you have only like 10 big blinds, the game has now reached a point where it's solved. There's a right thing to do. There's a wrong thing to do. Okay. With 400 big blinds, I mean, there's a lot more room for looseness and creative thought and, okay. you know, deviative strategies and all this kind of stuff. And, and for an example, talk us through the last tournament there you were in. Uh, the, the last tournament I was in was uh, actually at the weekend. There was a, a series of three tournaments in Ireland, uh, one which was called the ACOP, which is the Amateur Championships of uh, Irish Poker. That was on you. That was live on YouTube, wasn't it? You they're all, yeah, yeah. They all have a little bit of streaming and all this kind mm. of stuff at this stage. But uh, I mean, the ACOP is in name only. You get all the kind of you, well, you get certainly some of the Irish professionals playing. You wouldn't necessarily get people coming from different countries to play. Uh, after that, there was the European Deep Stack, which you would get um, quite a lot of like French players, Dutch, the Scandies all come over. Um, and then the last one, I think, was uh, the Unibet Open, which is kind of a, a tour that travels around to different countries, you know, like, uh, you know, one day, it'll, one day it'll be in Ireland, the next day it might be in uh, Barcelona or wherever, Malta, wherever it is, you know, it's like a tour that travels yeah. around, basically. Yeah. Mm. And which one was the one that you, you sent? Remember you sent? You uh, well, I, I, did, I actually had a back to back results. I, I managed to get a, um, a chop, which means you get down to the last three or four people and you divide up the prize pool cool. in the deep stack. And then I came fourth in the Unibet Open. So, Wow. Out of how many people in both uh, of them? There'd be like maybe four or five, six hundred people in both. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, my God. So you're really like. What kind of wins are we, are we talking about? Well, Where are we going tonight? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are we going back to Perth? <laughs> 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 no, 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 never again. Uh, what was the winnings? Very adamant I think there. there. Was, um, I think they got twenty. The guts of twenty for both of them. So twenty and then twenty for the for the other one. Wow, nice. But I, I actually made a really uh, what I would consider a terrible error in the last one, um, which in real terms probably cost me, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand. <laughs> you know, but I. Yeah. I acknowledge that it was a mistake, but other people wouldn't view it as a mistake, but uh, okay. I would certainly consider it a mistake, you know? Mm -hmm. So do you go back over hands when you're, like, the next day, you're saying, like, somewhere yeah. I can learn from that, or it's yeah, just our... you kind of try yeah. and talk to people who may be better than you, basically, like, you know, if, if you're doing something, it's always good to speak to people who are you know, probably at a, a higher level than you and can be like, well, actually, you know, did you think about this? And you may not have thought about that, you know? Yeah, uh, but yeah, you would have to review your hands. There's a lot, uh, you know, with the upper echelons of poker, the amount of study that goes into the game off the table is is huge. You know, like people be studying four or five hours every day, crunching the numbers, crunching the numbers, and then bringing it back to the table. Really? You know, not yeah. every professional does that, mm. but there's people the really out there. good guys, or the hungry young guys, are definitely doing that. You know, and when you're like so, like a, a week in the life of a professional poker player, is it like, would you divide it into kind of like research, finding the right uh, games versus playing the games? Or is there bits where you just need to rest because you've been yeah, doing it, probabilities it, for three days straight? I mean, it can really vary. You know, there's there's lull times in the Irish calendar where there'll be there'll be no real games of note and you may have to travel abroad which comes with costs and expenses and you need to figure out actually is this going to be profitable I'm going to lose a thousand before I've even played mm. a tournament or a cash game and not everyone has the ability to do that you know or certainly most people don't including myself it's you know sometimes a lot of these uh, uh, abroad uh, schedules you need to really be th there's no room for self-deception you need to go is this going to be profitable Ca can I beat the game to this amount yeah. You know, so uh, it really depends on what's kind of coming up in the calendars uh, and, and and the schedules. Yeah. And do people sponsor 
the likes. The yeah, likes so you. like if yeah. you're if if someone thinks you're good, yeah, they may buy you into the tournament, but you'll have to give up, you know, forty percent of your winnings to them, right? Okay. Yeah. Or you know, it could so the really good players would sell it something that's called markup. So let's say the tournament costs ten to enter, and you wanted to buy fifty percent of them. You would have normally if they weren't selling at markup, you would have to pay them five. If they're selling at markup, you would have to pay them six for the fifty percent. Okay, and they take so the yeah, the margin. You're, you're kind of paying them for their time a little bit. Okay, yeah. and do you ever do that? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of to. I don't really agree with the concept of markup because I think basically, I, I think we don't really understand the mathematical side of tournament poker in so far as like what's a meaningful sample size. So there's part of me that doesn't agree with markup, but it is something that you need to do to kind of, you know, keep the keep the expenses down and give yourself a chance to play enough tournaments that your true ability is going to to come out, rise to the top. And so yeah, we we've talked about the the skill set of a, a a poker player. Is does anything does the brand of a poker player matter? You know, you know. Let's look at. Dan Bilzerian. Yeah, you know, no, he doesn't do that <laughs> anymore, probably. But yeah. is yeah. that important to, to you know social media? Does that come into yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, the following and stuff. You know, there's uh, a lot of streamers who have made a a really good living off streaming, playing poker. Who are all on Twitch, you know? Yeah. Okay, so you can get on Twitch for yeah, with poker as well. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. It's yeah. absolutely huge. Yeah. Wow. It's can not, not my thing. I don't. Can we not get you on that? Yeah, you know, have you not got a nickname? Well, you got a sneaky fa- Sam. Yes, <laughs> Sam. I've got some camera equipment over here. We can get this going. <laughs> I don't want sneaky Sam to stick anyway. That's gonna have to be edit that <laughs> out. The yeah. chopping block. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, y- y- like the the elite guys obviously are like you know really well marketed and it's all manicured and glossy and all this kind of stuff. So. Um, but in terms of getting sponsorship from one of the big sites like Poker Stars or uh, Party Poker, maybe, I mean that really. There are Irish guys who who stream on Twitch who who are sponsored, but it's it's very rare, you know. Yeah. Okay. And you kind of need to have like a unique kind of selling point. There's a guy called uh, Finton Hand who does really well. He was a he was a Poker Stars. Is pro. that his real second name? That yeah. That yeah. that's uh, I don't know what he plays as, but. I can't remember his, his username, but uh, yeah, he got sponsorship for a while, so yeah, it is possible. But yeah, it's definitely possible, but okay. it's not it's not the norm for sure, you know. Yeah. One of the things I was really curious about was like a lot of the people that listen to this are like they have got a, they've got a full time job most most people right or they're they have their own business. A lot of kind of people, mm. uh, you know, who have even commented on stuff that we've done have been other entrepreneurs stuff like that. Yeah. Um. They're they might like poker. They might want to have, I know, an extra maybe income, but also kind of some fun on the side. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, is this? Do you, would you tell those people the kind of super amateurs to stay stay out of that, or uh, is it okay to try to make a hundred quid here and there? The ruthless professional in me would tell them, you know, come in. The water's nice. <laughs> <Yeah. and everything. laughs> That's a real shark. But, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say at this stage the game has become so advanced that the amount of time that it's going to take for them to get to a level where they compete is if they're competent in anything else it's not going to be worth their time to try and try and learn the game essentially you okay know, it's too let, it's too advanced it, it, so interesting as well po- poker let's look at it as a profession yeah. you know what what do you have to learn before you even get a job <laughs> at, well poker? i mean there's there's lots of sk- there's there's different like any job in the world there's like soft skills and there's hard skills that you need to learn like you know i know people who actually aren't that good at poker but who have done amazingly well out of the game because they're charismatic or good looking or all these weird really? skills that they're good with people and they can they get backed by people to play you know tournaments and or, or cash games and they get into really good cash games like they they will get into games where you need an invite to get to because everyone else in the game is an amateur and all this kind of stuff you know okay so kind of people who are better at the Personal branding get a little bit yeah, of a nod. Like I mean, a little bit. You know, okay. it's it's kind of weird. It's 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 like a mirror. It, it, like to some extent, poker and, and life are like you know the same stuff. Kind of happens within poker. Okay. You know, um, but like you base you you definitely need a basic technical understanding of the maths of poker. Yeah, that's the f- the first thing you absolutely need. Uh, people who excel at the game, to my mind, have a kind of intuitive sense of, um, like 
body language and all the subtle non-communicative gestures and moves that we make or are, are very sensitive people who can somehow tune into the you know again the unsaid frequencies that we all emit when we feel a bit like sad or angry or okay tilted is what we would call in, in poker is when you're you know you lose a hand you're annoyed about it yeah you're tilted so you don't like you don't play your normal game you play a tilted version of your game Okay. Have you studied any, anything? Or actually, put any proper? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I've what kind of books have you read uh, on, studied, on um, human behavior? Numerous books on like actual body language, written by kind of FBI guys and all this kind wow. of like the stereotype of like you know what. But actually, a lot of it's true. What we do when we're uncomfortable. Let's give us some examples of oh, when well, people are um, bluffing. Without giving away the game. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the funny thing is when we when we're trying to self comfort, a lot of the time we kind of uh, rubber rubber our face or our head you know like that's a that's a way of self-comforting you know okay are you doing that on purpose uh, yeah, no, right now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh people do that you know people do that and okay. or, or on the most basic human level a lot of the time when this is all this is a real cliche in poker but like if someone is acting like they're really strong a lot of the time they have quite a weak hand okay or if they're acting really weak they actually have a strong hand. But surely at the highest level, this at is double bluff, triple yeah. bluff. Oh, that, that, that's the beauty of it. It's like yeah. Inception, you know. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a dream within a dream within a dream. Like, it's yeah. at the highest level, weird stuff is going on, you know. It's I can't, like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Weird, you know? Say if there was like 20 grand on the, on the hand, I would just be looking at the person, going, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'd be so fraud. I could, I don't think I'd, it'd be a good fit yeah. for me. I'd be very Do you ever, ever play for fun? Uh, no, I wouldn't actually. Uh, interesting. My idea of a nightmare is now, unfortunately, going to my mate's gaff and like sitting around playing poker. Like, <laughs> I'm know. sure it's their I nightmare too. I, so. You know, I'd like to spend. <laughs> I'd like to spend. No, I never win. Actually, the funny thing is, I, I really never win when I play with my friends. They, I think they think I'm just this <laughs> absolute <laughs> joker. Like, but uh, no, the game ro moves really slowly, and it's you know, it's just when you play poker for a living, you don't want to play with guys who are just kind of like don't really okay. understand even the rules of the games and you, I have to say oh it's your turn to go all the time yeah. and all this kind of stuff it's yeah okay no I wouldn't and let's talk about the we were talking about the mind and how important that is yeah let's talk about your time spent kind of introspectively you yeah. know looking at that side yeah brilliant uh, so I mean uh, what I realised was that you kind of th you could achieve a certain success in poker but uh, you have to devote if you want to be good at anything if you want any business to be, and it, there's a weird correlation between business and, and poker you know essentially you're managing yourself as a poker player as a small business you know okay you're not overexposing yourself to kind of unlucky things that can happen you should never have more than a certain percentage of your bankroll in play you know you should be following mathematically sound business procedures of surviving rough times etc etc diversified portfolio exactly yeah you, you really should yeah it's not a bad idea that's why people kind of do stake other people to play because you know they might not want to play that evening but there's a good game on so it's not a bad idea to have someone you think can win in the game playing for you and then you wake up and you might have a bit of money coming from that person or whatever it is or mm -hmm. passive you know, income again it obviously doesn't have to be yeah passive income but it doesn't obviously have to be all to do with poker like there's a lot of poker players who dip their toes in crypto and kind of all this kind of okay Trying to apply that elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because uh, what normally happens is with, with really good poker players who burn out a little bit, invariably, a lot of them find themselves trading. So that that's kind of a okay. natural progression because it's the same kind of equity calculations on the spot. Little bit gambly, little bit kind of... A lot of math involved. A, a lot, lot of, of math yeah. involved, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, what I realized was that, you know, you can devote yourself some, you, to something and really try and excel at it. But there also needs to be a balance, you know. Uh, after all the tournaments are done, there needs to be something left at the end of it. So with, with the last couple of years, I've been trying to spend a lot of time kind of, um, yeah, introspectively uh, trying, to, trying to improve what's left at the end of kind of a draining tournament series or something like that, you know. And what kind of things have you, have you what steps well, have that, you taken? Yeah, so that involved, uh, I went to uh, live in a meditation center for a couple of months. I had no basis or grounding in meditation at all. In fact, I thought it was like kind of mumbo jumbo-y nonsense. Okay. You know, I, I have a little bit of that mindset. That I'm like, oh God, 
Mm-hmm. You know, I remember when I was going down, my, my mother was like, oh, going down to navel gaze. What, what are you going <laughs> to do down there? You know? Find yourself. Yeah. yeah. Or, oh, God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, hate, <laughs> I hate to find yourself. <laughs> and, and so yeah. it was kind of like a meditative, uh, meditative place. Yeah. Well, it was a place down in uh, the Bear Peninsula uh, on the edge of the world, West Cork. Incredible natural beauty and rugged orange stone and all this kind of stuff. And you're totally digitally removed from all the, the hum and... Uh, interference I would say of like you know our overexposure to phones our overexposure to media yeah so what happens where does your phone go where's all the well it's right beside me here unfortunately but (laughs) when you're down there you just put it away you know you don't you don't have a phone and uh, you know the corrosive way that kind of sometimes unfortunately because of the nature of instant instant communication can be a bit disposable and a bit kind of cold and you don't really think about the way you communicate with someone um you know being in a in a community where people actually have to look each other in the eye and when there's difficult moments talk to each other and everything else it really brings you back to kind of uh i don't know i would say how we're kind of supposed to be as 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 humans mm-hmm. yeah which sounds a bit no, no it's grandiose, it makes complete sense though yeah yeah and it's something i'm very interested in as well like over oh. the years mark will tell you all the books and stuff I w- <laughs> yeah <laughs> we kind of lived together for a while uh, yeah. when you were in college and stuff i was reading these kind of eastern uh, religion books right. very interested in, in this kind of uh, the different paths that you can go, go down the paths, yeah. um because you know we all well the i don't mid- know about you but we were yeah in the catholic oh, thing yeah. it's very it's kind of our way or the highway it's with wrong, the right. with, <laughs> with the yeah. with the catholics um but I, th- I found that interesting in the eastern uh eastern kind of religions religions probably is too strong a word yeah. here um but there's a lot of flexibility and there's different ways of being that's okay Do you know yeah what I mean? absolutely yeah so uh with these with this particular center there are, are there people living there full time or is it something that's kind of like just on during the day yeah or there is it's uh there's a full-time community that live and would practice there uh, but there's also kind of people who live in and around the area who would drift in and out uh there would be people who don't practice meditation uh who would still be part of the community uh, yeah, there's a really diverse group of people. You know, the the area in general attracts a lot of kind of arty type. Yes. I don't want to call them hippie what people. Are you looking at me but for? Like yeah. you know. Yeah, I was like, I was like, yeah. It, it really does. <laughs> like this know, guy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you'd fit in well down there. <laughs> you, need to, you need to grow the hair out. I'd uh, say. Like, <laughs> long gone. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's brilliant. You run into lots of weird and wonderful, odd balls, Interesting people. but who sometimes you know make you think about something that you might not have thought about before in a different way so a, a day in the life down there a day in life uh, would be uh if you're you can volunteer down there so if that was the case you'd get up do a morning meditation maybe have a little bit of breakfast and then help change beds clean toilets run a cafe not not back to back obviously yeah, you know yeah. that wouldn't be good but uh, yeah, just help around the place, cut the grass, paint a fence, you know, build something, chop wood, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And no technology during the day or not? No, there really wouldn't. No, there hey. wouldn't. You'd be you'd be very much removed from it. Uh, the hostel itself, actually, I remember when I used to go to hostels when I was younger, I loved them like there was always such crack. And, yeah. you know, and I've been in hostels a couple of times and, and now like everyone's just like face down yeah. in a phone, you know? Mm. Yeah. Nothing random happens because... I I couldn't agree more. We were it's tough. Like when yeah. we started, kind of tra- me and my wife have done a lot of traveling. Yeah. Uh, over the last ten years, well, more than that, probably thirteen years. And we when we went to interrailing, we were eighteen. So that was yeah, twelve years ago. Uh, we didn't have Google Maps or anything, so we used to get lost all the time. And we'd go on these adventures, and we'd we'd have like one map that was really like just a tourist map. Didn't have you any did that names. in Paris recently. I did it in Paris recently because I uh, my phone was broken. Joey so from I, friends, like, it, it was actually be in the map, like. just be in the map, like yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember in the the hostels, there was way more of a buzz when people didn't have things to be. When yeah. you, it was kind of almost like the boredom would say, okay, let's let's get a there's a checkers board over there. Do you yeah. want? Do you know that type of feeling? Mm. Or then, even with the ma- you know no Google Maps, so you you probably have to ask a punter on the street like, oh you, yeah, you know this place, and he might say, no, I don't know that place, but this yeah. place is good. You know, go there. Like, and weird stuff happens. You know, like when me me and uh, Katie we, we arrived in Croatia. I I think about this now, and Mark will think this is absolutely nuts. Like, I re- we didn't have anywhere to stay, and this woman came up to us with with no English with a picture of a room 
in our house and we're just like yeah we'll just go stay with her i suppose <laughs> yeah. and then we we're like the family was living there it was really nice like yeah. but i remember like now i'm like if we even for somebody who enjoys that type of uh kind of novelty yeah it's it's hard for me to to, to for what to you go, gain in like. convenience you probably lack in connection with people exactly right? yeah. yeah and i mean uh, this place really did offer connection but i mean were you lo- did you feel you were losing something you know with i the definitely the felt totally and utterly spiritually yeah. malnourished i think you mentioned it like it's a zero sum game poker. yeah it's, i mean you know if you're good you're gonna get a little bit of money uh, you know if mm. you're if you're bad you're really not gonna be able to keep hold of too much money in the game it's a little bit predatory you know like mm. you're mm. looking for good games you're looking for weak spots mm. yeah uh, to target essentially there's no other way of yeah. saying it mm-hmm. you know you're trying to win their money that's mm-hmm. what the game is about yeah uh, you know if you think oh fuck they need that money for you know the milk and yeah, you're it's not, not necessarily giving it back you know mm, yeah. so i think you lose a little bit of your or this is what i thought before i before i kind of took this journey of looking at myself i thought maybe you're losing a bit of humanity by this being a, a big part of your life mm-hmm. but actually i don't think it necessarily has to be like that anymore you know uh, anything can offer you a community uh, depending on where you are internally so yeah i've kind of come to a different way of thinking about it than i was before i kind of you know and is there a certain practice uh, the meditation is there a name for uh, god i don't i actually don't know it's kind of guided practice it wasn't this mantra based uh, you know you're kind of saying something in your head or any of this kind of stuff it was yeah and I mean, it's really difficult to sit with yourself, or it certainly was for me. It mightn't be for for everyone, but I found it really difficult to sit with myself for. I tried the, the Headspace app when I was going to bed one day, and I fell asleep. I just kept you? falling asleep. Yeah, yeah you like can do it. So it's because you're chronically uh, you're chronically tired all the time, Mark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't need these well, bodies. You have to, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, you have to actively meditate as opposed to trying to wind down. I just felt. Yeah, just that pro- they're probably different things. Like mm. to be fair, like uh, what I would. Not that I'm an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but for me... You are sitting here with me, your legs crossed. Me, <laughs> 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 Floating. <laughs> Floating, yeah. I was going to say anything. <laughs> me- meditation is like kind of just all these awful or some awful thoughts come into your mind and yeah. you just like kind of meet them with a tiny bit of kindness and like don't don't follow them down this weird fucking rab- sorry, this no, weird rabbit hole that you kind of can get drawn down yeah or the way i'd look at it is like a little bit of string and then you pull on this string and all of a sudden you're you know all these nasty experiences that you may have had you're you're like having them again in your head and you're yeah feeling hot and flustered and, all and the feelings stuff. are real even though it's a th- just you know yeah, th- yeah i mean are they real or are they not real i, I, don't, I don't know it's weird language exper- to yeah you, like feelings. experiencing experiencing maybe stress that you were under before but you're not under now you might be lying in bed yeah do you know you know it's very interesting but I had lost the capacity to do that. Though. Like I, I couldn't really sit with myself if I was at home. I'd, I'd be, I'd have to have a film on while fuck yeah. playing a computer game or something. And yeah, I, I just had lost that. Uh, in fact, poker had become kind of an escape. The one kind of place I felt like really zen and calm was poker. Okay, but that necessarily wasn't a good thing because you're using it as a condition to be okay, and you, you know. You, you know you shouldn't really be you should be content anyway either way uh, yeah you know? balance yeah. is yeah. what you're looking for balance exactly mm. yeah and the balance had uh had been lost to an extent yeah you know so no. it's such an interesting way because it's it's the it's the complete opposite of what you think of someone who's a professional poker player mm. but or you think that they would have that innately but it's something that you have to kind of build in there of course yeah, yeah. like anyone else uh, and i've kind of come to the realization or uh, the people that i would consider really good at the game that mindset is such a crucial part of the game, perhaps even more so than the technical nuts and bolts that can be learnt and studied. But I mean, if your mindset is wrong and your internal kind of internal kind of seesaw is off, I mean, you're really going to struggle, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a really amazingly beneficial uh, kind of thing to do. And, and and how long did you spend in total? I probably spent around four or five months oh. on and off. I've kind of fell in love with West Cork. It's really beautiful, beautiful amazing place. place. Yeah. Like I said, all the weird, arty, creative mm. people you you yeah. you open up. And then what I what I realized was that this openness then had a huge merit for when I was sat at a table. You know, the openness yeah. stayed there 
and even the kindness stayed there a little bit but a, as a consequence you know I could tune into a lot that I, I perhaps hadn't been able to tune into before so it's super interesting it's really mm. it's, it's something that I think a lot of people that are listening to to this will be like this is something that they would like to do or like to explore and stuff like that as well so maybe something to look into mm. Mark could use a, an app that but i think that's probably <laughs> defeating the, the purpose um i know yeah i mean apps and meditation is <laughs> yeah. it not like yeah. is this is that possible i don't even know if it's possible like you know yeah. I, I remember i was in uh i was in thailand and i was there was a they had this buddhist that was uh, like a buddhist monk there in the temple right and he was i think the game was that he was trying to practice his english so you can go ask him questions mm-hmm. and then i heard some I was just in there looking around, but I heard someone ask him, hey, what's the point of meditation? And he goes, you're missing the point. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. That's <laughs> and I just, what a great answer. And your man just walked away. Man, He's like, I got, it's like, like yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sarky. You know? <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so we've been uh, over an hour. I remember we were talking again that yeah. we wouldn't make it to that long, but we're, we're absolutely smashing. So we, we, don't, we want to be respectful of your time here. We've got some rapid fire questions for the poker, God. For the poker guy here. Okay. Yeah. Right, some of these mightn't might necessarily apply to you now after this conversation. But I feel like this definitely has the capacity to, to get me in trouble or something. Get him. You know. Right. What, what apps do you use the most? Trick question. You're not supposed to be using your phone that much. Uh, <laughs> WhatsApp, unfortunately. Is that an okay. app? That's funny because yeah. you only text me through Instagram message, yeah, which is weird. Yeah, I just don't have your number. It's really weird. <laughs> I think you're one of the only people I text on Instagram, actually. I didn't yeah. even think, I didn't know it was a thing, like... Yeah. Like you can't do it on a laptop for I some did, reason. There's I no didn't think you had a phone. I thought you were running from uh, uh, internet cafe yeah, to internet cafe. No, no, yeah. I flirted with trying to not have a phone, actually, you know, or having a you know, kind of blockier type phone. But yeah. it's that balance between, like, hang on, like, how do you keep in touch with anyone if you're not on these things and then been two on them and all the rest of it, you know? Yeah, balance. I think everyone struggles with that, though. Like, yeah, understand. Luke likes to co- converse with me through Facebook message, then... <laughs> WhatsApp, also Instagram. I've also got a few different uh, yeah. emails that annoy uh, that annoys oh, yeah. Mark because I mean, he doesn't know where it's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> I've had uh, really difficult conversations with one of my best friends the last week, and I realised if we WhatsApp about it, invariably it's utter disaster. If we speak on the phone, totally fine. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm 100%. I'm, I'm you know, bored of that. Intonation, totally lost yeah. on WhatsApp, you know. Like in these big companies that we're, everyone's working for, they're using those instant messaging, like oh, for like Slack. Course. Every time I'm on a Slack message, I feel like I'm fighting everybody. Yeah, and then I yeah. called them, I'm like... The messaging it, doesn't it, take it, account for for tone of, yeah. you know, and yeah. even sarcasm. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's awful. It's yeah. awful. Yeah. I, I'm, you know. Whoever figures yeah. that one out is going to make some money. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite social media and why? Or do you even use social media? I've noticed... Uh, I don't really mm. use Facebook, but I still have it. Uh, Instagram, I suppose, I use. But again... Uh, find all the problems that don't sound like so negative but uh, yeah. the social media I'm not too keen on to be honest and yeah. I think if I it, if I get to where I would like to be I probably wouldn't be engaged with social media whatsoever uh, if possible if that's the thing yeah um, have you ever had any other any business ideas that you, you never acted upon or you did and it didn't go anywhere uh, I've, uh, I've had a few ideas none that have struck me as particularly inspired or <laughs> anything but yeah I think business is fascinating and I think it's, you know, if you if you put something into business and it's really your baby, a lot of the time you're probably going to be able to make it work, you know. Uh, with this corona thing, <laughs> I've had a few ideas about the World Series going to happen in Vegas. Is there something that can be done with gloves or fucking masks, selling them yeah. over there, all this kind of thing? But just fleeting ideas that I would never, ever pursue in a million years. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm way too lazy to, <laughs> you know, do that kind of stuff. How much money is enough money? Interesting question for for a poker player, I think, mm. because uh, I will say that the the money side of things, you know, not that I'm a gazillionaire or anything like that, uh, or money isn't what drives me playing poker. I, you know, I was very competitive in sport for the duration of my teenage years, and mm. I love the competitive element of poker. It makes me feel like I'm still going down training for Joe's three times a week. Yeah, you know. Uh, I think if you have enough money that you can keep yourself safe and your family secure, you know, and you don't mm. have to stress too much about it, you're going to yeah. be all right. I think that's spot on. Spot it's on. Safety and security and money. 
does, yeah. does bring that means yeah, to an know, end kind of. money's weird in, in poker as well I mean sometimes you have lots of money sometimes you really don't have money mm. uh, there's a weird kind of uh, ecosystem of like you, you, you kind of borrow money but because you're not really on the grid of of kind of normal practice you're not necessarily going to be dealing with banks and all that kind of stuff so okay. well, money's a weird one and po poker players have this weird thing where they're like oh yeah I went broke and they're kind of like almost boastful about it which is really weird you know they, they, they'll even use different language to say the actual reality of like I've lost all my money playing uh -huh. poker yeah. yeah they'll say stuff like my know, first startup didn't go too well yeah, yeah. Like pivot the, the, <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the pivot yeah but have enough to keep yourself and your family safe and, okay. yeah, and the odd tra a trip to West Cork yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. Okay. a few here's pints one. pints of Murphy's and all the rest of it here's one right. what do you fear uh, death death do you think about it a lot? Yeah, lots. Yeah. So do I. Compulsively, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. How do you think that's affected your decisions? Oh, it's definitely made me act out and self sabotage in so many ways over the years. It's only the last couple of years that I've actually, even like that question would like deeply unsettle me a couple of years ago. But um, yeah, it, it would. I would think about it quite a lot. Like, how do you cope with it? Oh, I, I don't know if I do, man. <laughs> I just try and yeah. uh, this openness that I seem to have been able to achieve the last not that it may last it may not it you know consciousness what is consciousness where is it you know like we don't really we can't pinpoint it in yeah. anywhere we can't pinpoint it in the brain or the mind yeah so it's a very difficult thing to do when someone says that to you that extension mm. like maybe it does maybe it is transferable you know maybe it fucking shoots out into the that energy emits somewhere into the universe and we kind of we, uh, I, I'm not saying reincarnation per se, mm. but I mean there is a kind of body of science that suggests that, you know, things can go other places and and into different kind of, don't want to say realms. The realms or yeah, no. planes. Well, like you know. like I, I was like a lot of our, a lot of my, t especially teenage years, maybe like twenties as well. Like there was something I thought about a lot. You know, yeah. getting on planes, all these type of stuff. It was ter like. Uh, would you be? panicky like anxious so you wanna so back in <laughs> and, and it's so there funny because <laughs> suggests... so i was a, a very bad flyer for, mm. a, for a long time i hate flying yeah and I, I i learned i learned to deal with it uh on a mental level but it never stopped me from getting on a plane i was i went all over the world yeah, i've been it's a necessity just, yeah. yeah i've gone everywhere <clears throat> but the the biggest the biggest thing that helped me was separating the mind from the the body and not kind of shaming myself when I am feeling fear. Do you know what I mean? Like, how, how did you do that? Valium, I presume. So something. lots of Valium, <laughs> uh, just booze. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Valium is definitely going to separate. Yeah, I just like I, I, you crush up your Valium, slide it. No, uh, I'm not Wall, joking. Wall just joking. Type, uh, <laughs> no, but like what, what I did was I, I listened. I think it was a, someone talking on a podcast about it, and they were saying that. Uh, all of the stuff that's happening, you know, like the reactions. So mm. say if you're feeling the adrenaline and stuff like that, like my legs go like almost Jenny. numb. Yeah. Oh, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's just, just accepting that as just a, a body reaction. It's There's a gap in between feeling that and how I'm reacting in my mind, okay. you know? Mm. So I, I'm, I'm kind of taking myself out of that. Mm. Um, and it seems to work. Like. Did, that, did that help? Did it, you? It, it did yeah. 100%. Right. Rather than what I used to do is I'd feel start to feel fear I'd be with my wife. I'd feel like shame about being, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. a weak person or of course, yeah. that kind of way. And yeah, then yeah. It, it gets in any of it. And then once it got to a, a level of panic, there was no coming back. Yeah. The rest of the, it was like a nightmare eight hours ahead of me. And there's nothing, I mean, you're trapped on a plane yeah. feeling panicky and anxious. Yeah. That's It's been years. It's be. been years since it's been like that. And yeah. I think I've got to a point where. Did you, didn't you learn about aviation, you know, you yeah. went into it and then learned that the really? st statistically. Yeah, I learned. That a seems a really clever thing to do. If yeah. I learned. That's fine, yeah. something I do. I've learned every, not everything, obviously, about aviation. <laughs> I've, it's a pilot I've, now. I've, I've really, uh, uh, God, we'd love, we need to get a pilot on here. <laughs> that would be, I need to, like, we need to talk. Sure, okay. Uh, find, find out. But, um, yeah, so the, I'll look at all the statistics about what actually brings down planes. This sounds, this sounds pretty dark, mm. but I went into uh, plane disasters and all that type of stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, like turbulence, generally doesn't bring down planes like the the tolerances that they have yeah. are is way more than is in nature do you know right. uh, all that type of stuff anyway we could do another podcast on that my point is uh one a, a guy from uh west Munster as well said this to me once that really helped 
and he's not really in business. He is kind of, but he's not. So in sales, it's up and down as well. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I've been in sales for a long time. Um, and I get stressed about that sometimes. Poker too, yeah. Up and he downs. said, ups, ups and downs. And uh, he said, remember, Luke, you're just a chimp in blue jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a song. Uh, yeah, he's like, it just doesn't really matter. Yeah. Nothing. Don't like, take yeah. You're just a monkey. Like, yeah. you know, you're or, statistically more likely to be eaten by a shark anyway, aren't you? Yeah. Especially in this room anyway. Yeah, 100%. Uh, than dying in a plane crash. I really? just made that up. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> 70% of uh, uh, stats are made up. Of, uh, corona yesterday that you're more likely to win the lotto than get coronavirus or die from coronavirus. Yeah, really? It's, yeah. it's tiny amount, yeah. yeah. So like For now. Yeah. Again, I think that's just, you know, media, media hysteria. And because the way we communicate now has become more fearful and like yeah. pissed off that it's all instant, that's why we're all been nuts about this. I actually thing. noticed that on the recently I've been watching news, like, you know, and I was uh, afterwards I thought to myself, actually... Do I ever feel better after no, re- watching the news? I feel actually I feel down and yeah, you yeah. know there was the place I was in West Cork, you know, no one would engage with uh, any news? No. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the cafe with you until yeah, you yeah. clean those toilets. Those toilets aren't gonna clean themselves, so yeah. okay, two more questions. All right, hit me. If you could advise somebody to learn one skill, what would it be? Maybe it's the it's the eighteen year old Sam. Um I would say now something to do with uh, self-compassion or kind of self-kindness and figuring out a way to try and kind of be kind to yourself and understand that kind of, uh, you know, you're not really your thoughts. You're, you know, your thoughts are your thoughts and you're you and, and that's it. You know, if, if I could get a young person to understand that, but I, I don't think, I think that's not something that you can... You have I don't to think go you get that until you're in your yeah. 20s or 30s at oh, least, yeah. probably. Or, mm. yeah, 40s, <laughs> if you get it. 50s, yeah. 60s. We'll get there eventually. Yeah. Who knows? Like, yeah. Okay, last one. What book w- would you recommend to the 18 year old, Sam? God, what a question. One book. Uh, my dad wrote a book, which Did is called he? Cloud of Desolation. It does a great guy. I remember he used to give us lifts around. around. Yeah, he, he always comes over to watch my uh, poker tournaments so okay, if I yeah. make a final table and everything else. Um, what book? My, my favourite book, again, unfortunately, it's linked with poker. Is a book called uh, uh, Shut Up and Deal by a guy called Jesse May. But it's a book that kind of is about life within a weird microcosm of poker, you know? And because of where I am now I can understand lots of the stuff when I re I reread it a lot and like 10 years later that I'm reading it I get concepts that he's talking about um that I, I didn't understand um amazing. back then the the book that has re- had a huge profound amazing impact on me is a book called The Joy of Living by uh I can't even I remember I've heard the dude's name Ming uh, Ming Yor Rinpoche or something like this okay. and do you think Geraldine has that it, Maybe that's where I've seen yeah, it. Yeah. It really, uh, because I was in such an open place, I found it incredibly transformative. And I mean, it, it probably took me around six months to read. You'd, I'd read the same page, like, you know, for for an hour, I'd read the same page. Wow. And it made an impact. Mm. Yeah. I, I, so it's one of those ones you have to read as opposed yeah. to audio book. But right, again, yeah. I think experientially, you would have to have got to a place where like, you know, you, you know, you've you've experienced suffering before you actually were able to glean it. I don't yeah. think it's going to be a, a kind of precur. You know, it's not going to okay save you from all this. Yeah. So you'd recommend stuff. that to the thirty-year-old? So. I, I would recommend. <laughs> I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah. And just, but I mean, so first if you're sixteen or seventeen reading it, you're going to be like, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Mumbo jumbo, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. But so first the poker one, and then afterwards, uh, when the put it on your shelf. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're involved in poker, you wouldn't get the poker one. But to me, to my mind, it's the best book written about poker. Uh, oh, what's that called again? Uh, Shut up and deal. Shut and deal. Okay, cool. Good it's cool. unparalleled, incredible, incredible. Until you write writer. your own. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, Sam, uh, I'd like to thank you on here for coming onto the the podcast today. Um, we usually. Uh, on our guest with the t-shirt although we're off site today so that that will be in the mail all right oh, yeah. so we'll send I'll, you i'll wait for that yeah. you know I'll send, <laughs> i know you'll be waiting with a uh, bathed breath for oh, that um so uh, again thank you very much it gives us uh, gives our listeners uh, maybe a different insight into a different career path that's what we're all about here and also uh if somebody you know picks up shut up and deal and becomes yeah. a the next superstar or uh becomes a monk in uh in west, in west cork you know either way there's a there's a path there for you. Or both. So, yeah. Yeah. So th- thanks, thanks thanks very much. I really enjoyed being on and uh, 
thanks very much for thanks, Sam. having me and all the rest of it. All right. Talk to you Great later. Stuff. Bye. Bye. See you. Thanks, Mel. And there you have it, guys. So now you know exactly how to quit the 9 to 5 and uh, go play professional poker uh, full time and ho hopefully do it in a very successful way like our friend Sam. Um, I'd like to thank all you guys for listening. Uh, if you guys want to have a chat about any of the books that are mentioned in this uh, in this episode, if you want to reach out with some feedback, you can reach us at luke at shark.ie. Um, you can also uh, reach us on the socials. If this is something that you found interesting, if you, this is something you think that a friend would enjoy, if they're looking to make a career out of gambling or make a career out of playing poker more specifically, pass us on, you know? And if you're, and again, if you're an international listener, uh, send us an email as well. We'd love to hear from you as well as the Shark Nation grows. Um, yeah, so we will see you next week. We've got a few really strong uh, guests coming up over the next month or so. So it's exciting times here. Uh, we're getting, uh, getting more listeners every week, every month. So thank you very much for all the support. And uh, if you'd like to um, you know, get a, a, a Shark Pod uh, t-shirt, they are available on Amazon and we will be putting the link in the show notes. Until next week, see you soon. Bye-bye.